Andrew Jackson, March 15, 1767 to June 8, 1845, was an American lawyer, planter, general, and statesman who served as the seventh president of the United States from 1829 to 1837. Before becoming president, he rose to prominence as a general in the United States Army and served in both houses of Congress. Jackson was often commended as an advocate for regular Americans and for his efforts to preserve the Union of States. But he was also chastised for his racial policies, particularly his treatment of Native Americans. Jackson was born in the Colonial Carolinas before to the American Revolutionary War. He became a frontier lawyer and married Rachel Donaldson Robards. He was briefly a member of the United States House of Representatives and Senate, representing Tennessee. After retiring, he was a justice on the Tennessee Superior Court from 1798 to 1804. Jackson bought a property subsequently known as the Hermitage, becoming a wealthy planter who owned hundreds of African-American slaves during his life. In 1801, he was appointed colonel of the Tennessee militia and later elected commander. He led forces throughout the Creek War, 1813-1814 winning the Battle of Horseshoe Bend and negotiating the Treaty of Fort Jackson, which obliged the indigenous Creek population to yield extensive regions of present-day Alabama and Georgia. Jackson became a national hero after winning the Battle of New Orleans in 1815, during the concurrent battle against the British. He later commanded United States forces in the First Seminole War, which resulted in Florida's conquest from Spain. Jackson temporarily served as Florida's first territory governor before rejoining the Senate. He ran for the presidency in 1824. He gained a plurality of the popular and electoral votes, but no contender received an electoral majority. With the assistance of Henry Clay, the House of Representatives elected John Quincy Adams in a contingent election. Jackson's supporters said that Adams and Clay had made a corrupt bargain and started their own political organization, which would later become the Democratic Party. Jackson ran again in 1828 and defeated Adams by a landslide. In 1830, he signed the Indian Removal Act. This act, which has been described as ethnic cleansing, evicted tens of thousands of Native Americans from their traditional homelands east of the Mississippi and claimed thousands of lives. Jackson faced a challenge to the Federal Union's integrity when South Carolina sought to reject a high protective tariff imposed by the federal government. He threatened to deploy military force to enforce the tax, but the situation was resolved once it was adjusted. In 1832, Jackson vetoed a bill from Congress to reauthorize the Second Bank of the United States, claiming that it was a corrupt organization. After a long struggle, the bank was dismantled. In 1835, Jackson became the first president to pay off the national debt. He survived the first assassination attempt on a sitting president. In one of his final acts as president, he acknowledged the Republic of Texas. After leaving office, Jackson backed Martin Van Buren's and James K. Pope's presidency, as well as Texas annexation. Jackson's legacy is still controversial, and opinions are frequently polarized. Supporters see him as a protector of democracy and the Constitution, while detractors point to his reputation as a demagogue who ignored the law when it suited him. Jackson's presidency has regularly been rated as above average, albeit his reputation has dipped since the late 20th century. Early Life and Education Andrew Jackson was born on March 15, 1767, in the Waxhaws area of the Carolinas. His parents were Presbyterian Scots-Irish colonists Andrew Jackson and Elizabeth Hutchinson, who came from Ulster, Ireland, in 1765. Jackson's father was born in Carrickfergus, County Antrim, circa 1738, and his ancestors came to Northern Ireland from Scotland after the Battle of the Boyne in 1690. Jackson had two older brothers, Hugh, born 1763, and Robert, born 1764, who accompanied his parents from Ireland. Elizabeth harbored strong feelings toward the British, which she passed on to her sons. Jackson's precise birthplace is unknown. Jackson's father died at the age of 29 in a logging accident while clearing ground in February 1767, three weeks before the birth of his son Andrew. After that, 
Elizabeth and her three sons moved in with her sister and brother-in-law, Jane and James Crawford. Jackson later claimed that he was born on the Crawford Plantation in Lancaster County, South Carolina, although second-hand accounts imply that he was born at another uncle's estate in North Carolina. When Jackson was young, Elizabeth believed he would become a preacher and paid for him to be educated by a local clergyman. Eight, he learned to read, write, and deal with arithmetic, as well as Greek and Latin, but he had a strong personality. And hot-tempered for the ministry. Revolutionary War Jackson and his older brothers, Hugh and Robert, fought for the Patriots against British soldiers during the American Revolutionary War. Hughes served under Colonel William Richardson Davy and died of heat exhaustion in June 1779, following the Battle of Stono Ferry. Following the Battle of Waxhaws in May 1780, Elizabeth urged Andrew and Robert to take part in militia drills. They worked as couriers and were there at the Battle of Hanging Rock in August 1780. Andrew and Robert were apprehended in April 1781, when the British occupied the home of a Crawford relative. A British officer insisted on having his boots cleaned. Andrew refused, and the officer stabbed him with a sword, causing scars on his left hand and forehead. Robert also resisted and received a smack to the head. The boys were sent to a POW camp in Camden, South Carolina, where they became starved and developed smallpox. The brothers were released to their mother in late April as part of a prisoner swap. Robert died two days after returning home, but Elizabeth was able to nurse Andrew back to health. After he recovered, Elizabeth offered to nurse American prisoners of war kept on British prison ships in Charleston, South Carolina. She developed cholera and died shortly thereafter. The war made Jackson an orphan at age 14 and increased his hatred for the values he associated with Britain, in particular aristocracy and political privilege. Early Career Legal career and marriage. Following the American Revolutionary War, Jackson worked as a saddler before briefly returning to school to teach youngsters to read and write. In 1784, he left the Waxhaws region for Salisbury, North Carolina, to study law with attorney Spruce Mackey. He finished his schooling with John Stokes and was admitted to the North Carolina Bar in September 1787. Shortly after, his buddy John McNary assisted him in being appointed as a prosecuting attorney in the Western District of North Carolina, which ultimately became the state of Tennessee. Jackson made a stop at Jonesboro while driving to his new employment. While there, he purchased his first slave, a woman about his age. He also fought his first duel, accusing another barrister, Waitstill Avery, of undermining his reputation. The duel ended with both men firing in the air. Jackson launched his new employment in the frontier town of Nashville in 1788, quickly rising in social standing. He became a protege of William Blunt, a significant figure in the region. Jackson was named Attorney General of the Marrow District in 1791, and Judge Advocate for the Militia the next year. He became interested in land speculation and finally formed a partnership with fellow lawyer John Overton. Their cooperation focused mostly on claims filed under the 1783 Land Grab Statute, which granted white inhabitants of North Carolina access to Cherokee and Chickasaw territories. Jackson met Rachel Donaldson Robards, the daughter of John Donaldson's widow, while boarding at her home. Rachel, the younger, was in an unpleasant marriage with Captain Lewis Robards, and the two had split up by 1789. Following their separation, Jackson and Rachel became romantically involved and began living as husband and wife. Robards filed for divorce, which was granted based on Rachel's infidelity. The pair was formally married in January 1794. In 1796, they purchased their first plantation, Hunter's Hill, on 640 acres, 260 hectares, of land near Nashville. Early Public Career Jackson joined the Democratic-Republican Party, which is the major party in Tennessee. In 1796, he was elected as a delegate to Tennessee's Constitutional Convention. When Tennessee gained statehood that year, he was elected as its U.S. congressman. Jackson fought against the Jay Treaty in Congress, 
blame George Washington for purportedly removing Democratic Republicans from public office, and voted against a resolution of gratitude to Washington along with numerous other Democratic Republican legislators. He argued for Tennesseans' right to militarily resist Native American interests. In 1797, the state assembly elected him to the United States Senate, but he resigned after six months. In the spring of 1798, Governor John Sevier appointed Jackson as a Tennessee Superior Court judge. In 1802, he was also appointed Major General, or Commander, of the Tennessee Militia, a post selected by a vote of the militia commanders. The vote was deadlocked between Jackson and Sevier, a popular Revolutionary War veteran and former governor, until Archibald Rowan, the governor, broke the tie in Jackson's favor. Jackson later charged Sevier with fraud and bribery. Sevier responded by questioning Rachel's honor, sparking a shootout on a public roadway. Soon after, they reunited to duel, but they parted ways without firing at each other. Planting Career and Slavery Jackson resigned as judge in 1804. He was virtually bankrupt when the land and mercantile ventures he had undertaken on the basis of promissory notes failed in the aftermath of a previous financial catastrophe. He had to sell Hunter's Hill, as well as 25,000 acres, 10,000 hectares, of land he had purchased for speculation, and instead purchased a smaller 420-acre, 170 hectares, plantation in Nashville, which he named the Hermitage. He focused on recouping his losses by becoming a successful farmer and businessman. The Hermitage would expand to 1,000 acres, 400 hectares, making it one of the largest cotton farms in the state. Jackson, like most plantations in the southern United States, employed slave labor. Jackson owned nine African-American slaves in 1804, more than 100 by 1820, and more than 150 by the time he died in 1845. During his lifetime, he possessed 300 slaves. Jackson supported the paternalistic view of slavery, which held that slave ownership was morally acceptable as long as slaves were treated with humanity and their fundamental needs were met. In practice, slaves were viewed as a type of wealth whose productivity needed to be maintained. Jackson imposed harsh punishments on slaves who disobeyed or ran away. For example, in an 1804 advertising to recover a runaway slave, he offered $10 more, for every hundred lashes any individual will give him up to 300 lashes, a figure that would almost certainly have been fatal. Jackson was also involved in the local slave trade. His acquisition of fortune in both slaves and property eventually elevated him to the ranks of Tennessee's wealthy families. Duel with Dickinson, Adventure with Burr In May 1806, Jackson engaged in a duel with Charles Dickinson. They had gotten into a disagreement over a horse race, and Dickinson allegedly used a slur against Rachel. During the duel, Dickinson fired first, and the bullet struck Jackson in the chest. The wound was not life-threatening since the bullet fragmented on his breastbone. Jackson returned fire, killing Dickinson. The killing harmed Jackson's reputation. Later that year, Jackson became involved in former Vice President Aaron Burr's scheme to conquer Spanish Florida and expel the Spanish from Texas. In 1805, Burr, who was touring the western United States after gravely wounding Alexander Hamilton in a duel, stayed with the Jacksons at the Hermitage. He eventually persuaded Jackson to join his expedition. In October 1806, Jackson wrote to James Winchester that the United States can conquer not only Florida, but all Spanish North America. He instructed the Tennessee militia to be ready to march at any time, when the government and constituted authority of our country require it, and agreed to furnish boats and provisions for the mission. Jackson wrote to President Thomas Jefferson, telling him that Tennessee was prepared to preserve the nation's honor. Jackson also raised reservations about the venture. He told Louisiana Governor William Claiborne and Tennessee Senator Daniel Smith that some of the participants in the adventure might want to secede from the United States. Jefferson issued an order in December to arrest Burr for treason. Jackson organized the militia to apprehend the conspirators, knowing he would not be arrested due to his enormous paper trail. He testified before a grand jury in 1807, claiming that Burr's colleague, 
James Wilkinson, was guilty of treason rather than Burr. Burr was cleared of the allegations. Military career. War of 1812. Creek War. On June 18, 1812, the United States declared war on the United Kingdom, thereby beginning the War of 1812. Though the conflict was primarily motivated by maritime concerns, it gave white American settlers on the southern frontier with an opportunity to defeat Native American resistance to settlement, undermine British support for Native American tribes, and seize Florida from the Spanish Empire. Jackson promptly promised to raise volunteers for the fight, but he was not called up until the U.S. force was repeatedly defeated in the American Northwest. Following these setbacks, in January 1813, Jackson enlisted almost 2,000 volunteers to protect New Orleans from a British onslaught. When his forces arrived in Natchez, General Wilkinson, the commander in New Orleans and the man Jackson accused of treason following the Burr escapade, ordered them to halt. Jackson received a letter from the Secretary of War, John Armstrong, declaring that his volunteers were no longer needed and that they should give over any supplies to Wilkinson before disbanding. Jackson refused to disband his troops instead leading them on the grueling march back to Nashville, receiving the nickname Hickory, later Old Hickory, for his tenacity. After returning to Nashville, Jackson and one of his colonels, John Coffey, engaged into a street brawl over honor with Jesse and Thomas Hart Benton. Nobody was killed, but Jackson received a gunshot to the shoulder that nearly killed him. Jackson hadn't entirely healed from his wounds when Governor Willie Blunt summoned the militia in September 1813 following the August Fort Mims massacre. In reprisal for an ambush by American militia at Burnt Corn Creek, the Red Sticks, a Confederate party aligned with Tecumseh, a Shawnee chief fighting with the British against the United States, slaughtered approximately 250 militiamen and civilians at Fort Mims. Jackson's goal was to annihilate the Red Sticks. In October, he led 2,500 militiamen south from Fayetteville, Tennessee, and established Fort Strother as a supply station that he dispatched his cavalry under General Coffey ahead of the main force, demolishing Red Stick villages and seizing supplies. On November 3, Coffey defeated a band of Red Sticks at the Battle of Tallahatchie, followed by Jackson's victory at the Battle of Talladega later that month. By January 1814, the expiration of enlistments and desertion had decreased Jackson's force by approximately 1,000 volunteers, but he persisted in his attack. The Red Sticks launched a counterattack at the battles of Amukfa and Enotokopo Creek. Jackson resisted them, but was forced to retreat to Fort Strother. Jackson's army was strengthened by additional recruitment and the formation of a regular army unit, the 39th United States Infantry Regiment. A united force of 3,000 men, comprising Cherokee, Choctaw, and Creek allies, attacked a Red Stick fort at Horseshoe Bend on the Tallapoosa River, manned by approximately 1,000 men. The Red Sticks were overrun and slaughtered. Almost all of their warriors were murdered, and over 300 women and children were taken captive and given to Jackson's Native American allies. The win ended the power of the Red Sticks. Jackson resumed his scorched earth strategy, which included burning communities, destroying supplies, and starving Red Stick women and children. The campaign ended with William Weatherford, the Red Stick leader, surrendering, though some Red Sticks fled to East Florida. On June 8, Jackson was made a Brigadier General of the United States Army. Point ten days later, he was promoted to Brevet Major General and given command of the 7th Military District, which comprised Tennessee, Louisiana, Mississippi Territory, and the Muscogee Creek Confederacy. Jackson imposed the Fort Jackson Treaty with the agreement of President James Madison. The treaty forced all Creek, including those who had remained allies, to turn over 23 million acres, 9,300,000 hectares, of land to the United States. Jackson subsequently focused his attention on the British and Spanish. In August, he transferred his men to Mobile, Alabama, accusing Mateo Gonzalez Manrique, the Spanish governor of West Florida, of arming the Red Sticks and threatening an attack. The governor responded by urging the British to land at Pensacola to defend it, thereby violating Spanish neutrality. The British attempted to take Mobile, but their invasion fleet was defeated at Fort Bowyer. Jackson then invaded Florida 
defeating Spanish and British soldiers in the Battle of Pensacola on November 7. Afterward, the Spanish surrendered, and the British withdrew. Weeks later, Jackson discovered that the British were preparing an attack on New Orleans, the entrance to the lower Mississippi River and control of the American West. He withdrew Pensacola, bolstered the garrison at Mobile, and led his soldiers to New Orleans. Battle of New Orleans Jackson arrived at New Orleans on December 1, 1814. He declared martial law because he was concerned about the loyalty of the city's Creole and Spanish residents. He increased his force by striking an alliance with Jean Lafitte's smugglers and recruiting free African Americans and Creek, paying non-white volunteers the same as whites. Jackson had a force of roughly 5,000 soldiers when the British came. The British arrived in New Orleans around mid-December. Admiral Alexander Cochrane was the operation's main commander, while General Edward Pakenham commanded a 10,000-strong army, many of whom had served in Napoleonic Wars. As the British marched along the Mississippi River's east bank, Jackson built a fortified position to prevent them. The climactic fight occurred on January 8, when the British made a frontal assault. Their forces provided easy targets for the Americans, who were shielded by parapets, and the attack failed miserably. The British lost almost 2,000 soldiers, including Pakenham, against the Americans 60. The British left New Orleans at the end of January, but they still posed a threat. Jackson refused to lift the martial law and kept the militia under arms. He authorized the execution of six militiamen for desertion. Some Creoles enrolled as French citizens with the French consul and asked to be released from the militia because of their foreign identity. Jackson then ordered that all French citizens leave the city within three days. They detained Louis Louellier, a member of the Louisiana legislature, for writing a newspaper article denouncing Jackson's decision to continue martial law. U.S. District Court Judge Dominic F. Hall issued a writ of habeas corpus requesting Louellier's release. Jackson also arrested Hall. A military court ordered Louellier's release, but Jackson imprisoned him and banished Hall from the city. Although Jackson lifted martial law after receiving official confirmation that the Treaty of Ghent, which ended the war with the British, had been signed, his prior actions harmed his reputation in New Orleans. Jackson's triumph elevated him to national hero status, and on February 27, 1815, he received the thanks of Congress and the Congressional Gold Medal. Though the Treaty of Ghent was signed in December 1814, before the Battle of New Orleans, Jackson's victory ensured that European powers would not effectively oppose American dominance of the territory between Mobile and New Orleans. This power enabled the American government to disregard one of the treaty's provisions, which would have returned the creek lands acquired in the Treaty of Fort Jackson. Presidential Aspirations Election of 1824 The Panic of 1819, the United States' first long-term financial downturn, prompted Congress to cut the military's size and eliminate Jackson's generalship. In exchange, Monroe appointed him the first territory governor of Florida in 1821. He served as governor for two months before returning to the Hermitage in poor health. During his recovery, Jackson, a Freemason since at least 1798, was elected Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of Tennessee from 1822 to 1823. Around this time, he also concluded discussions with Tennessee to purchase Chickasaw Territory. This became known as the Jackson Purchase. Jackson, Overton, and another colleague had speculated on some of the land, and they used their portion to establish Memphis. Jackson agreed to run for president in the 1824 election in 1822, and in July, the Tennessee legislature nominated him. At the time, the Federalist Party had disbanded, leaving four major candidates for the Democratic-Republican Party nomination, William Crawford, John Quincy Adams, Henry Clay, and John C. Calhoun. Jackson was supposed to be a stalking horse candidate, preventing Tennessee's electoral votes from going to Crawford, who was regarded as a Washington insider. Jackson surprisingly attracted considerable support outside of Tennessee and emerged as a credible candidate. He benefited from the growth of white male suffrage after the War of 1812. He was a popular war hero with a reputation for decisiveness.
and independence to bring about transformation in Washington. He was also portrayed as an outsider who advocated for all people, blaming banks for the country's downturn. During his presidential campaign, Jackson reluctantly ran for one of Tennessee's United States Senate seats. Jackson's political managers, William Berkeley Lewis and John Eaton, persuaded him that he needed to unseat incumbent John Williams, who opposed him. The legislature chose Jackson in October 1823. He was dedicated to his senatorial duties. He was designated chairman of the Committee on Military Affairs but refrained from debating or proposing legislation. He used his time in the Senate to forge alliances and reconcile with former foes. Eaton continued to push for Jackson's candidacy and updated his biography. And wrote a series of widely circulated pseudonymous letters portraying Jackson as a proponent of Republican liberty. Historically, Democratic and Republican presidential nominees were chosen in informal congressional nominating caucuses. In 1824, the majority of Democratic Republicans in Congress boycotted the caucus, and the power to select nominees was transferred to state nominating committees and legislative bodies. A Pennsylvania convention nominated Jackson, elevating him to the position of top national contender rather than just regional candidate. When Jackson won the Pennsylvania candidacy, Calhoun withdrew from the presidential race. Jackson went on to win the nomination in six more states, finishing second in three. In the presidential election, Jackson received 42% of the popular vote. More crucially, he earned a plurality of electoral votes, receiving 99 from states in the South, West, and Mid-Atlantic. He was the only candidate to win states outside of his geographical base. Adams swept New England, Crawford won Virginia and Georgia, and Clay won three western states. Because no candidate received a majority of 131 electoral votes, the House of Representatives held a contingent election under the Twelfth Amendment. Clay was eliminated from consideration since the amendment states that only the top three electoral vote winners can be elected to the House. Clay, who was also Speaker of the House and presided over the election resolution, viewed Jackson's administration as a calamity for the country. Clay rallied around Adams, who won the contingent election on the first ballot. Adams chose Clay as his Secretary of State, prompting Jackson's supporters to accuse Clay and Adams of making a corrupt bargain. After the congressional session ended, Jackson resigned from his Senate seat and returned to Tennessee. Election of 1828 and Death of Rachel Jackson Following the election, Jackson's allies organized a new party to weaken Adams and limit his reign. Adams' presidency went poorly, and his actions harmed it. He was viewed as an educated elite who overlooked the demands of the people. He was unable to make any progress since Congress blocked his initiatives. In his first annual message to Congress, Adams claimed that we are palsied by the will of our constituents, which was understood as his opposition to representative democracy. Jackson responded by emphasizing common residents' demands and proclaiming that the voice of the people must be heard. The Tennessee legislature nominated Jackson for president in October 1825, more than three years before the 1828 election. He attracted significant support from both the South and the North, including Calhoun, Jackson's vice presidential running mate, and New York Senator Martin Van Buren. Meanwhile, Adams' support in the southern states dwindled as he enacted the Tariff of 1828, also known as the Tariff of Abominations, by opponents. Jackson's victory in the presidential election was emphatic. He garnered 56% of the popular vote and 68% of the electoral vote. The election brought an end to the one-party system that had emerged during the era of good feelings, as Jackson's supporters created the Democratic Party, while those who opposed him later founded the Whig Party. The political campaign was dominated by the personal attacks directed at both candidates. Jackson was accused of being the son of an English prostitute and a mulatto, and he was described as a slave dealer who trafficked in human flesh. A series of leaflets known as the Coffin Handbills accused him of murdering 18 white men, including the troops he hanged for desertion, and of stabbing a man in the back with his cane. They said that he deliberately butchered the Native American women and children in the combat of Horseshoe Bend, ate the carcasses of Native Americans he killed in combat, 
and threatened to cut off the ears of legislators who questioned his actions during the First Seminole War. Jackson and Rachel were accused of adultery for living together before her divorce was official, and Rachel learned of the accusation. She had been stressed out throughout the election, and just as Jackson was about to leave for Washington for his inauguration, she became unwell. She died of a stroke or heart attack a few days later, before her husband was elected president. Jackson believed that Adams' supporters' abuse had accelerated her death, saying at her funeral, May God Almighty forgive her murderers, as I know she forgave them. I never can. Presidency, 1829-1837 Jackson landed in Washington, D.C., on February 11 and started assembling his cabinet. He appointed Van Buren as Secretary of State, John Eaton as Secretary of War, Samuel D. Ingham as Secretary of Treasury, John Branch as Secretary of the Navy, John M. Berrien as Attorney General, and William T. Berry as Postmaster General. Jackson was inaugurated on March 4, 1829. Adams, furious over his defeat, declined to attend. Jackson became the first president-elect to take his oath of office on the east portico of the United States Capitol. In his inaugural address, he promised to safeguard state sovereignty, respect presidential limits, reform the government by dismissing disloyal or incompetent officials, and maintain a fair attitude toward Native Americans. Jackson invited the public to the White House which was promptly overrun by well-wishers who caused minor damage to its furnishings. The spectacle earned him the nickname King Mob. Reforms and Rotation in Office Jackson believed Adams' government had been corrupt, therefore he launched probes into all executive agencies. These investigations found that $280,000, equivalent to $8 million in 2023, had been taken from the Treasury. They also resulted in cost savings for the Department of the Navy of $1 million, equivalent to $28,600,000 in 2023. Jackson urged Congress to tighten rules against theft and tax evasion, as well as to modernize the government's accounting system. Jackson adopted what he referred to as rotation in office. Previously, the president would leave existing appointees in office and replace them through attrition. Jackson enforced the Term of Office Act of 1820, which limited office term and enabled the president to remove current office holders. Appoint fresh ones. During his first year in office, he replaced around 10% of all federal staff with loyal Democrats. Jackson maintained that office rotation minimized corruption by holding office holders accountable to the popular will, but it also served as political patronage, earning it the nickname, the spoils system. Petticoat Affair. During his first two and a half years in office, Jackson focused on what became known as the Petticoat Affair or Eaton Affair. Margaret, the wife of Secretary of War Eaton, was at the center of the affair. She had a reputation for being promiscuous, and like Rachel Jackson, she was accused of infidelity. She and Eaton had been close before her first husband, John Timberlake, died, and they married nine months later. With the exception of Barry's wife Catherine, the cabinet members' wives followed the example of Vice President Calhoun's wife Floride and refused to socialize with the Eatons. Though Jackson defended Margaret, her presence divided the cabinet, which had been so unproductive that he rarely brought it into session. The continued disagreement led to its dissolution. In the spring of 1831, Jackson sought the resignations of all cabinet members save Barry, who resigned in 1835 after a congressional investigation exposed his mishandling of the post office. Jackson attempted to recompense Van Buren by appointing him as minister to Great Britain, but Calhoun defeated the nomination with a tie-breaking vote. Van Buren, along with newspaper editors Amos Kendall and Francis Preston Blair, would become regular members of Jackson's kitchen cabinet, an informal, rotating group of advisors who Jackson relied on for decisions even after forming a new official cabinet. Indian Removal Act Jackson's presidency signaled the start of a national strategy of Native American relocation. Before Jackson assumed office, the relationship between the southern states and the Native American tribes that lived within their borders was tense. The governments believed they had complete control over their territory, whereas the local tribes considered themselves as sovereign nations with a title to the land they lived on. 
Significant segments of the five major tribes in what was then known as the Southwest, the Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek, and Seminoles, began to absorb white civilization, including schooling, agricultural skills, a road system, and basic industry. Regarding the tensions between the state of Georgia, Adams attempted to handle the Cherokee issue by offering financial incentives to encourage their relocation west of the Mississippi, but most declined. During Jackson's first days in office, certain southern states passed legislation expanding state sovereignty over Native American territory. Jackson endorsed the state's freedom to do so. His stance was eventually clarified in the 1832 Supreme Court test case for this act, Worcester v. Georgia. Georgia had detained a group of missionaries for entering Cherokee land without a permit. The Cherokee deemed the arrests unconstitutional. The court, led by Chief Justice John Marshall, ruled in favor of the Cherokee, holding that imposing Georgia law on them was unconstitutional. Horace Greeley claims that after Jackson heard the ruling, he remarked, well, John Marshall has made his decision, but now let him enforce it. Although the phrase could be apocryphal, Jackson made it clear that he would not utilize the federal government to enforce the verdict. Jackson utilized federal authority to compel the separation of indigenous tribes and Europeans. Jackson signed the Indian Removal Act in May 1830, after Congress barely passed it. It granted the president the authority to negotiate treaties to purchase tribal lands in the eastern United States in return for lands set aside for Native Americans west of the Mississippi, as well as considerable discretion over how to spend the federal funds committed to the discussions. The law was intended to be a voluntary relocation program, but it was not executed as such. Jackson's government frequently obtained relocation agreements by bribery, fraud, and intimidation, and the chiefs who signed the treaties did not always represent the entire tribe. The relocations might also be a cause of misery, the Choctaw relocation was riddled with corruption, theft, and incompetence, causing significant hardship to the people. In 1830, Jackson personally negotiated with the Chickasaws, who swiftly agreed to relocate. In the same year, Choctaw chiefs signed the deal of Dancing Rabbit Creek, the majority opposed the deal but followed its provisions. In 1832, Seminole chiefs signed the Treaty of Payne's Landing, which stated that the Seminoles would travel west and join the Muscogee Creek Confederacy if they deemed the new location fit. The Second Seminole War, which lasted six years, began in 1835 when the majority of Seminoles refused to relocate. The Muscogee Creek Confederacy relinquished their country to Alabama at the Treaty of Casita in 1832. Their private ownership of the land was supposed to be preserved, but the federal government didn't enforce it. The government encouraged voluntary transfer until the Creek War of 1836, when nearly all Creek were relocated to Oklahoma Territory. The Treaty of New Dakota, signed in 1836, saw Cherokee leaders give their land to the government. Van Buren, Jackson's successor, enforced their evacuation, which became known as the Trail of Tears. Jackson also implemented a deportation policy in the Northwest. He was unsuccessful in removing the Iroquois Confederacy from New York, but when some Meskwaki, Fox, and Sauk sparked the Black Hawk War by attempting to cross back to the east bank of the Mississippi, the peace accords ratified after their defeat severely curtailed their territory. During his governorship, he signed approximately 70 treaties with American Indian tribes. He had removed almost all the Native Americans east of the Mississippi and south of Lake Michigan, about 70,000 people, from the United States, however, it was done at the cost of thousands of Native American lives lost due to the unsanitary conditions and epidemics arising from their dislocation, as well as their resistance to expulsion. Jackson's implementation of the Indian Removal Act increased his popularity with his constituents. He added nearly 170,000 square miles of land to the public domain, mostly benefiting U.S. agricultural interests. The measure also benefited small farmers, as Jackson permitted them to buy reasonable acreage at low costs and gave squatters on property that had previously belonged to Native Americans the chance of purchasing it before it was sold to others. Nullification Crisis Jackson had to face another obstacle that had been building up since the start of his first tenure. 
The tariff of 1828, enacted in the final year of Adams' administration, imposed a high protective tariff to keep northern manufacturing firms from competing with lower-cost British goods. The tariff affected southern cotton planters' income, it raised consumer prices but not cotton prices, which had fallen sharply in the preceding decade. The South Carolina Exposition and protest was immediately sent to the United States Senate following the enactment of the tariff. This document, authored anonymously by John C. Calhoun, stated that the Constitution was a covenant between individual states. When the federal government went beyond its authorized powers, such as instituting a protective tariff, a state had the authority to declare the action unlawful and null and void within its borders. Jackson suspected Calhoun of drafting the exposition and protest and rejected his view. Jackson contended that Congress had complete jurisdiction to impose tariffs, and that a dissenting state was undermining the majority's will. He also required tariffs, which generated 90% of federal revenue, to meet another of his presidential goals, reducing the national debt. The matter escalated into a personal rivalry between the two men. For example, on April 13, 1830, participants made after-dinner toasts in honor of Thomas Jefferson's birthday. Jackson toasted, Our Federal Union, it must be preserved. A direct challenge to nullification. Calhoun, whose toast immediately followed, retorted, The Union, next to our liberty, the most dear. As a compromise, Jackson backed the Tariff of 1832, which cut levies from the Tariff of 1828 by nearly half. The bill was signed on July 9, but it failed to appease fanatics on both sides. On November 24, South Carolina approved the Ordinance of Nullification, declaring both tariffs null and void and threatening to split from the United States if the federal government attempted to collect the duties through force. Jackson responded by sending warships to Charleston Harbor and threatening to hang anyone who supported nullification or secession. On December 10, he issued a proclamation against the nullifiers, condemning nullification as antithetical to the law and spirit of the Constitution, rejecting the right to secede, and pronouncing South Carolina to be on the verge of revolt and treason. On December 28, Calhoun, who had been elected to the United States Senate, resigned as vice president. Jackson urged Congress to approve a force bill enabling the military to enforce the tariff. Calhoun condemned it as dictatorship. Meanwhile, Calhoun and Clay worked to develop a new compromise tariff. Jackson saw it as a successful approach to terminate the conflict, but he insisted on the approval of the force bill before signing. On March 2, he signed the force bill and the tariff of 1833. In a final act of defiance, the South Carolina Convention met and revoked its nullification decree while also nullifying the force bill. Two months later, Jackson pondered on South Carolina's nullification, the tariff was only the pretext, and disunion and the Southern Confederacy the true object. The next pretext will be the Negro or slavery issue. Bank War and Election of 1832 A few weeks after his inauguration, Jackson began researching how he could replace the Second Bank of the United States. President Madison established the bank in 1816 to help the U.S. economy recover from the War of 1812. Monroe had nominated Nicholas Biddle as the bank's executive. The bank was a repository for the country's public funds that also serviced the national debt. It was established as a for-profit business that prioritized the interests of its owners. In 1828, the country was rich and the currency was stable, but Jackson saw the bank as a fourth department of government administered by an elite, what he termed the money power, that tried to control the labor and earnings of the real people, planters, farmers, mechanics, and laborers rely on their own hard work to prosper. Furthermore, Jackson's own near bankruptcy in 1804 as a result of credit-fueled land speculation swayed him away from paper money and toward a hard money policy. In his first annual address in December 1829, Jackson openly questioned the bank's legitimacy and the soundness of its money. Jackson's supporters also claimed that it granted preferential loans to speculators and merchants over artisans and farmers, that it used its funds to bribe politicians and the press, and that it had connections to overseas creditors. In response to Jackson's threat in early 1830, 
Biddle used the bank's huge financial holdings to ensure the bank's reputation. And his allies argued that the bank was the key to economic success and stability. By the time of the 1832 election, Biddle had spent more than $250,000, equivalent to $7,630,000 in 2023, on printing pamphlets, campaigning for pro-bank legislation, recruiting agents, and lending money to editors and lawmakers. On the surface, Jackson and Biddle's positions did not appear incompatible. Jackson was willing to maintain the bank if it included some level of federal oversight, limited its real estate holdings, and had its property taxed by the states. Many of Jackson's cabinet colleagues believed a compromise was attainable. In 1831, Treasury Secretary Louis McLean informed Biddle that Jackson was willing to establish a modified version of the bank. However, Biddle did not consult Jackson personally. Jackson privately indicated opposition to the bank. Officially, he stated that he would leave the decision to the people. Henry Clay, who had decided to run for president against Jackson in the 1832 election, eventually persuaded Biddle to take open action. Biddle would agree to seek renewal of the charter two years earlier than planned. Clay contended that Jackson was in a bind. If he vetoed the charter, he would lose the votes of his pro-bank constituents in Pennsylvania. If he signed it, he would lose his anti-bank constituents. After the Reckharder bill was passed, Jackson vetoed it on July 10, 1832, arguing that the country should not surrender the will of the majority to the desires of the wealthy. Election of 1832 The 1832 presidential election illustrated the rapid growth of political parties under Jackson's presidency. The Democratic Party's inaugural national convention, held in Baltimore, nominated Jackson's vice presidential candidate, Martin Van Buren. The National Republican Party, which had its inaugural convention in Baltimore in December 1831, nominated Clay, who is now a Kentucky senator, and John Sargent of Pennsylvania. The Anti-Masonic Party, with a platform based on resistance to Freemasonry, did not endorse Jackson or Clay, both of whom were Masons. The party nominated William Ward of Maryland and Amos Elmaker of Pennsylvania. In addition to the votes Jackson would lose due to the bank veto, Clay predicted that Jackson's Indian Removal Act would alienate voters in the East. However, Jackson's losses were countered by the act's popularity in the West and Southwest. Clay also expected Jackson to lose votes because of his stance on internal changes. Jackson had rejected the Maysville Road Bill, which would have funded an upgrade of a portion of the National Road in Clay's home state of Kentucky. Jackson had contended that funding internal upgrades with national funds for local projects was illegal. Clay's strategy failed. Jackson was able to activate the Democratic Party's powerful political networks. The Northeast supported Jackson because he advocated for a high tariff, while the West supported him because the Indian Removal Act reduced the number of Native Americans in the region and increased the availability of public property except for South Carolina which passed the Ordinance of Nullification during election season and refused to support any party by voting for the future governor of Virginia, John B. Floyd, the South backed Jackson's implementation of the Indian Removal Act and willingness to compromise by signing the Tariff of 1832. Jackson won the election by a landslide, with 55% of the popular vote and 219 electoral votes. Removal of Deposits and Censure Jackson interpreted his triumph as a mandate to continue his campaign against the bank's control over the national economy. In 1833, Jackson issued an executive order prohibiting the deposit of treasury receipts in banks. When Secretary of the Treasury McLean declined to carry out the order, Jackson replaced him with William J. Duane, who also refused. Jackson subsequently selected Roger B. Taney as interim secretary, who carried out Jackson's program. With the loss of federal deposits, the bank had to reduce its credit. Biddle utilized this contraction to generate an economic downturn in order to persuade Jackson to concede. Biddle put it this way, nothing but the evidence of suffering abroad will produce any effect in Congress. The attempt failed, as the economy rebounded. And Biddle was blamed for the recession. Jackson's actions prompted many who disagreed with him to establish the Whig Party.
They claimed to resist Jackson's increase of executive power, referring to him as King Andrew I and naming their party after the English Whigs, who opposed the British monarchy in the 17th century. In March 1834, the Senate censured Jackson for unlawfully assuming jurisdiction over the Treasury Department, which was the responsibility of Congress, and refused to confirm Taney's appointment as Secretary of the Treasury. In April, however, the House ruled that the bank should not be rechartered. By July 1836, the bank no longer had any federal deposits. Jackson directed that federal monies be put in state banks that supported the administration's policies, which detractors dubbed pet banks. The number of these state banks more than doubled under Jackson's presidency, and investment patterns shifted. The bank, which previously served as the federal government's fiscal agent, made significant investments in trade and provided financing for interregional and worldwide trade. State banks were more receptive to state governments, investing substantially in land development, speculation, and state-funded enterprises. Despite Taney's successor, Levi Woodbury's, efforts to restrict them, the pet banks increased their loans, contributing to a speculative boom in Jackson's final years in office. Jackson paid off the national debt in January 1835, the only time this has happened in U.S. history. It was paid down by tariff receipts, carefully managed federal support for internal infrastructure such as roads and canals, and the sale of public lands. From 1834 to 1836, the government experienced an unparalleled increase in land sales. At its peak in 1836, land sales earnings were 8 to 12 times larger than in an average year. During Jackson's presidency, 63 million acres of public land, roughly the size of Oklahoma, were sold. After Jackson's term finished in 1837, a Democrat majority Senate overturned his censure. Panic of 1837. Despite the economic boom that followed Jackson's bank war victory, Western land speculation triggered the Panic of 1837. Jackson's transfer of federal funds to state banks in 1833 caused Western banks to relax their lending restrictions, while the Indian Removal Act made enormous tracts of former Native American lands accessible for purchase and investment. Two of Jackson's actions in 1836 contributed to the Panic of 1837. One was the Specie Circular, which required Western properties to be purchased only with money backed by Specie. The measure was meant to stabilize the economy by curbing credit speculation, but it resulted in a transfer of gold and silver from Eastern banks to Western banks to meet the financing demands of property purchases. The other was the Deposit and Distribution Act, which moved federal funds from eastern to western state banks. When eastern banks withdrew their loans to solve economic issues in international trade, they were unable to pay the British in specie. The panic pushed the U.S. economy into a downturn that lasted until 1841. Physical Assault and Assassination Attempt Jackson was the first president to face a physical assault and an assassination attempt. On May 6, 1833, Robert Beef Randolph hit Jackson in the face with his hand after Jackson ordered Randolph's discharge from the Navy for theft. Jackson declined to file charges. On January 30, 1835, while Jackson was leaving the United States Capitol, Richard Lawrence, an unemployed house painter from England, leveled a gun at him and misfired. Lawrence pulled out another revolver, which also misfired. Jackson struck Lawrence with his cane until others interfered to hold him. Lawrence was ultimately declared not guilty due to insanity and institutionalized. Slavery Throughout Jackson's presidency, slavery remained a minor political issue. Though federal forces were utilized to defeat Nat Turner's slave uprising in 1831, Jackson ordered their withdrawal immediately, despite local inhabitants' requests that they remain for safety. Jackson saw the issue as too disruptive to the nation and the delicate ties of the Democratic Party. In 1835, the American Anti-Slavery Society used the postal system to deliver anti-slavery publications into the South, challenging Jackson's viewpoint. Jackson denounced these agitators as monsters who should face the consequences of their actions for attempting to undermine the Union by inciting sectionalism. The act sparked rioting in Charleston, and pro-slavery Southerners asked that the Postal Service prohibit the dissemination of the papers.
To remedy the issue, Jackson directed that the tracts be given exclusively to subscribers whose names could be made public. That December, Jackson called on Congress to restrict the circulation in the South of incendiary publications intended to incite the slaves to insurrection. Foreign Affairs The Jackson administration successfully negotiated a trade deal with Siam, the first East Asian country to sign one with the United States. The administration also secured commercial deals with the United Kingdom, Spain, Russia, and the Ottoman Empire. In his first annual message to Congress, Jackson addressed the subjects of spoliation claims and recompense for foreign nations' capture of American ships and sailors during the Napoleonic Wars. He successfully settled these claims with Denmark, Portugal, and Spain using bluster and tact, but he struggled to collect spoliation claims from France, which refused to pay an indemnity agreed to in an earlier treaty. Jackson petitioned Congress in 1834 to sanction reprisals against French property if the country refused to pay and to arm for defense. In response, France prepared its Caribbean fleet for wartime operations. Both parties wished to avoid a conflict, but the French demanded an apology for Jackson's aggressive behavior. In his 1835 annual message to Congress, Jackson declared that he refused to apologize but did not want to menace or insult the government of France. The French were relieved and agreed to pay $5 million, equivalent to $147,677,400 in 2023, to resolve the accusations. Since the early 1820s, a substantial number of Americans had been migrating to Texas, a territory of the newly established Republic of Mexico, Jackson advocated for the United States to acquire the region as early as 1824. In 1829, he tried to buy it, but Mexico refused to sell. By 1830, there were twice as many settlers from the United States as from Mexico, causing tensions with the Mexican government and sparking the Texas Revolution. Throughout the struggle, Jackson secretly allowed the settlers to receive weapons and money from the United States. In April 1836, they defeated the Mexican forces and declared the region's independence as the Republic of Texas. The nascent republic requested that Jackson recognize and annex it. Jackson wanted to do it, but he was cautious because he was concerned about the country's ability to retain independence from Mexico. He was particularly concerned that Texas had legalized slavery, which could divide Democrats in the 1836 election. Jackson acknowledged the Republic of Texas on March 3, 1837, the last full day of his administration. Judiciary Jackson appointed six justices to the Supreme Court. The majority lacked distinction. In January 1835, Jackson nominated Roger B. Taney to the court as a prize for his efforts, but the nomination did not get Senate approval. When Chief Justice Marshall died in 1835, Jackson nominated Taney again, he was approved by the new Senate and served as Chief Justice until 1864. He was respected during his service on the bench, but he is primarily recognized for his highly reviled ruling in the Dred Scott v. Sanford. On the final day of his presidency, Jackson signed the Judiciary Act of 1837, which established two new Supreme Court seats and reformed the federal circuit courts states accepted into the Union. During Jackson's presidency, two new states joined the Union, Arkansas on June 15, 1836, and Michigan on January 26, 1837. Both states enhanced Democratic dominance in Congress and helped Van Buren win the presidency in 1836, as new states tended to vote for the party that had done the most to admit them. Later Life and Death, 1837-1845 Jackson's presidency concluded on March 4, 1837. Three days later, Jackson departed Washington, D.C., and moved to the Hermitage in Nashville, where he remained powerful in national and state affairs. To combat the inflation produced by the Panic of 1837, Jackson advocated for an independent treasury system that would prohibit the government from creating paper money and force it to hold its money in silver and gold. During the 1840 presidential election, Jackson campaigned for Van Buren in Tennessee, but Van Buren had become unpopular due to the ongoing downturn. The Whig Party nominee, William Henry Harrison, 
won the election employing a campaign technique identical to that of the Democrats. Van Buren was represented as an uncaring aristocrat, while Harrison's war record was lauded. He was portrayed as a common man. Harrison won the 1840 election, and the Whigs secured majorities in both houses of Congress. However, Harrison died a month into his term, and was succeeded by his vice president, former Democrat John Tyler. Jackson was heartened by Tyler's lack of party loyalty, and he applauded him for vetoing two Whig sponsored attempts to establish a new national bank in 1841. Jackson advocated for the annexation of Texas. He was anxious that the British would utilize it as a base to threaten the United States, therefore, he insisted it was part of the Louisiana Purchase. Tyler signed an annexation deal in April 1844, but it was later linked to the extension of slavery and was not recognized. Van Buren, Jackson's intended Democratic Party candidate in the 1844 presidential election, opposed annexation. Disappointed by Van Buren, Jackson persuaded fellow Tennessean James K. Polk, who was supposed to be Van Buren's running mate, to run as the Democratic Party's presidential contender instead. Polk beat Van Buren for the nomination and won the general election over Jackson's longtime adversary, Henry Clay. Meanwhile, the Senate approved a bill to annex Texas, which was signed on March 1, 1845. Jackson died on June 8, 1845, of dropsy, tuberculosis, and heart failure. He was 78 years old. On June 8, 1845, Jackson died from dropsy, tuberculosis, and heart failure at the age of 78. At his deathbed, he was surrounded by relatives, enslaved people, and friends, and he is remembered as saying, Do not cry, I hope to meet you all in heaven, yes, all in heaven, white and black. He was buried with his wife Rachel. Personal life. Family. Jackson and Rachel had no children together, although they did adopt Andrew Jackson Jr., the son of Rachel's late brother Severn Donaldson. Donaldson's other children, John Samuel, Daniel Smith, and Andrew Jackson, were raised by the Jacksons. They were also guardians for Rachel's orphaned grand-nephew, Andrew Jackson Hutchings, and the orphaned children of a friend, Edward Butler, Caroline, Eliza, Edward, and Anthony, who moved in with the Jacksons after their father died. Jackson also lived with three Creek children, Lincoya, a Creek orphan Jackson adopted after the Battle of Tallahatchie, and two boys named Theodore and Charlie. For the first time in U.S. history, two women served as unofficial first ladies for the widower Jackson. Emily Donaldson, Rachel's niece, married Andrew Jackson Donaldson, Jackson's private secretary, and served as hostess at the White House. The president and Emily were estranged for more than a year during the Petticoat incident, but they eventually reconciled, she resumed her job as White House hostess. Sarah York Jackson, Andrew Jackson Jr.'s wife, became co-hostess of the White House in 1834 and assumed full hostess duties when Emily died of TB in 1836. Temperament Jackson was known for being short-tempered and harsh, which intimidated his opponents. He was able to use his rage intelligently to achieve his objectives. He could keep it under control when appropriate, for example, when he traveled to Washington as senator during the campaign for the 1824 election, he was affable and urbane. According to Van Buren, he remained calm in stressful situations and made deliberate decisions that he tended to take things personally. If someone crossed him, he became obsessed with crushing them, 364, for example, on the last day of his presidency, Jackson stated that he had only two regrets, not hanging Henry Clay or shooting John C. Calhoun. He also felt a deep feeling of loyalty. He saw threats to his friends as risks to himself, but he wanted unconditional commitment in exchange. Jackson exuded confidence without displaying arrogance. His self-confidence enabled him to persevere in the face of hardship. He would stick to his plans once he had made them. His reputation for being both quick-tempered and confident worked in his favor. It deceived opponents into believing he was simple and direct, causing them to underestimate his political acumen. Religious Faith In 1838, Jackson joined the First Presbyterian Church in Nashville.
Both his mother and wife had been committed Presbyterians their entire lives, but Jackson claimed that he had delayed officially joining the church until after his retirement to prevent charges that he did so for political purposes. Legacy Jackson's legacy is contentious and divisive. His contemporary, Alexis de Tocqueville, portrayed him as the voice of the masses and their passions. He has been portrayed as a frontiersman representing the independence of the American West, a slave-owning member of the Southern Gentry, and a populist who advocated faith in the wisdom of common citizens. He has been portrayed as a statesman who significantly advanced the spirit of democracy and upheld the principles of American constitutionalism, as well as an autocratic demagogue who crushed political opposition and violated the law. In the 1920s, Jackson's rise to prominence became associated with the concept of the common man. This concept defined the period as a populist rejection of societal elites and a recognition of every individual's worth regardless of class or rank. Jackson was viewed as its personification, 388, an individual free of societal restrictions who may accomplish great things. In 1945, Arthur M. Schlesinger Jr.'s landmark Age of Jackson recast Jackson's legacy through the lens of Franklin D. Roosevelt's New Deal, describing the ordinary man as a member of the working class against exploitation by capitalist interests. In the 21st century, Jackson's Indian Removal Act has been referred to as ethnic cleansing, the use of force, terror, and violence to homogenize an ethnic group. To fulfill the purpose of isolating Native Americans from whites, coercive force such as threats and bribery were employed to compel removal, and when resistance arose, unauthorized military action was used, as in the Second Seminole War. The act has been characterized as genocide, and its significance in the long-term destruction of Native American tribes and cultures is still questioned. Later presidents have taken diverse approaches to Jackson's legacy. Abraham Lincoln referred to Jackson's principles when negotiating the Union's issues in 1861, especially Jackson's grasp of the Constitution during the nullification crisis and the president's authority to interpret the Constitution. Franklin D. Roosevelt utilized Jackson to reframe the Democratic Party, characterizing him as a champion of the oppressed and disadvantaged, as well as a fighter for social justice and human rights. Donald Trump utilized Jackson's legacy to pitch himself as the president of the common man, hailing Jackson for saving the country from a rising aristocracy and imposing a tariff to safeguard American workers. In 2016, President Barack Obama's administration announced that Jackson's portrait would be removed from the $20 bill and replaced with one of Harriet Tubman. The initiative was placed on hold during Trump's presidency, but President Joe Biden's administration revived it in 2021. Jackson is largely regarded favorably as a president, but his reputation began to deteriorate in the 1960s. His conflicting legacy is reflected in opinion polls. According to a 2014 survey of political scientists, Jackson was the ninth most popular president but the third most divisive. He was also listed as the third most overrated president. In a C-SPAN poll of historians, Jackson was ranked 13th in 2009, 18th in 2017, and 22nd in 2021. I want you to express your personal thoughts and reactions to the documentary in the comments area. Use this chance to express your respect for Kuroda's unrelenting tenacity and resilience, as well as your thanks for the sacrifices made by him and his friends. Encourage viewers to subscribe to your YouTube channel in order to join our ever-growing community, and ask them to help spread the word by sharing the video with their friends and family. By raising awareness about this important piece of history, we can ensure that Sergeant Robert Kurotis and his fellow veterans' legacy lives on and inspires future generations. Through the creation and distribution of this documentary, you have the ability to honor Sergeant Robert Kurotis' legacy in a profound and enduring way, ensuring that his narrative resonates with audiences for years to come.